Welcome to One Plus One, I'm Courtney Act. As one of Australia's top DJs, Tom Nash is no stranger to massive crowds, but after falling ill as a teenager, he was actually given a 10% chance of survival, which he says has forced him to think laterally and become better at problem solving. His TED talk on the subject has been viewed by millions of people around the world, and Tom has got a real gift for making you laugh and making you think. Um, we've been in establishments like this together before, but normally I'm the one with the drink in my hand and you're behind the DJ decks, but today we're both behind the bar. Yeah. Why? We're going to be making a gin martini together. Okay. Am I going to like this? Well, they'll definitely put hair on your chest. Okay, well, I've spent a lot of money having it lasered <laughs> off, so it'll just have to grow somewhere else. Yeah, well, I do feel the pressure to make it good for you. Okay, good. Yeah. You must be used to feeling under pressure in front of big crowds DJing, right? Yeah, for some reason the universe has decided that that's how I'm going to make a living, whether yeah. it be DJing or public speaking or whatever it is. But I still feel the pressure in this situation <laughs> a lot. Well, it's different when it's one-on-one, -on -one, right? Like when you're in front of a sea of thousands of people or hundreds yeah. of people, there's like that fourth wall there. That's true. There, there is a fourth wall, but I mean, if you can find solitude when you're performing in front of people, whether it be speaking, and I'm sure you know this better than I do, there can be solace that you can take in that, I guess. So, it, you know, it's a very introverted thing to do while being an extroverted activity. Making drinks is about... It's a necessary prerequisite yeah, to, to, to drink drinking drinks. drinks. That's exactly right. Your hawks are a deliberate choice, right, in manoeuvring the world. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the thing that I like about them, apart from the fact that they look pretty badass, is uh, that they're lightweight and easy to repair. And those electric hands that you can get sometimes can be very cumbersome and... You don't want your hand going flat. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. we've got enough things that we need to keep charged these days. Yeah. I don't need limbs that need to be charged as well. And now I'm going to pop just a tiny bit of vermouth in there. What is vermouth? It's a fortified wine, but that is... The extent of my knowledge about okay. it, I can tell you that. I'll stop asking <laughs> difficult yeah. questions. That's right. I also love that a martini is just a glass of booze. It's a cocktail pretending not to be a glass full of gin. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> and just pour 50-50 or 70-30. Who gets the 70? Who do you think? <laughs> Strong? Yes, please. Thank you, madam. My pleasure. <laughs> Shall we? Yeah, let's do it. Tom Nash, thank you for joining me on One Plus One. Thank you for the invitation. It's great to see you. We are of a similar age. I know you're turning yep. 40 this year. Yes, I am. I think 40 is a nice age. It because is, yeah. it's, it's got an impact to it. Because when you're in your 30s, you're like, I'm th mm. People hear 30. But when yeah. you say I'm four, they're like, oh. Right, yeah. And I feel like I've always been... But if you say that, if you say I'm 40, they'll be like, oh, you look amazing. <laughs> but I say I'm 40, they're like, yeah, whatever, oh, do your job, shut up. <laughs> I don't think you have aged in the last 10 years. I have. Okay. Yeah, I have. Gracefully. You. Gracefully, yeah, yeah. absolutely. I've matured like a fine wine. Yeah. Did Not you think actually. at 40 that you would be DJing some of the biggest parties in Australia? No. I didn't think for days after my first gig that I would be DJing <laughs> some of the biggest parties in Australia. So, no, I never had any uh, expectations or anticipation with respect to that career, I guess. Now, you're a, a DJ mm. and a party promoter. Yeah. Uh, that's where I know you. I remember yes. sort of in the mid to late 2000s, yeah, um, some, somewhere around that blurry period of that, history. It was very blurry. Yeah. There was gay bars on Oxford Street and yeah. then your night was, which was called Star... We're on the ABC, so I'm going to say Star People Who Like To Have Sex With Celebrities. How's Star that? Effers? Star Effers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Less confusing. Less confusing. <laughs> and um, 
I remember going in there and it was sort of this underground wonderland of mm. people who, it wasn't a gay bar, it wasn't a straight bar, it was just a place where people could come and rejoice and express themselves. Yeah. To really good music. Yeah. Um, Thank you. How did you go about creating that environment? Chris and I were uh, looking to start something. We wanted to have this career as uh, DJs and run our own events. Uh, Chris being your co-promoter. Chris, Chris, yeah, exactly, yeah. And I think we just, we, we wanted something like a brand that we had control over that we could do anything we wanted with. So employing staff, creating drink menus, doing decorations, branding, marketing. Um, and it was also a way that we could kind of slot ourselves in like musical Trojan horse, you know, <laughs> and just because we weren't DJs. I mean, like uh, Chris had DJed a little bit around the traps, but it was more or less just to play this song, play that song kind of thing. It wasn't what we all think of as a, DJ with technical abilities, and I certainly had far less than that. So I think my first, uh, no, I don't think I know, my first uh, DJ set was on our opening night in front of 500 people. <laughs> um, and Chris just taught me where the play button was and he's just like, just do that. <laughs> I'm like, I can handle that, that's fine. And uh, yeah, I think my set was probably terrible. Right, um, and I think, it couldn't have been that terrible. No, I think it was pretty terrible. Right, yeah, okay, I think, fair. But, I, but no one really cared right. because they just, they loved the event, they loved the decorations, they loved the vibe of the people and everything that we'd curated. And it ended up being, you know, the longest running weekly club night in Sydney. We did it every Saturday for like something like 13 years or yeah, something. Wow. And it, one of us was always there yeah. every week for like over a, a decade. There is something I think about the environment that, um, that your club nights created that felt uh, like a, a free place to mm. express yourself. Yeah, yeah. Did that come from an intentional, was it the door policy? Was it, you know, you and Mr Disorder sort of setting the tone? What do you think it was? It was absolutely intentional to make sure that the place was as fun and different to everywhere else as possible. Mm and to keep out a lot of people that would seek to make it the opposite mm. to that, of which there were plenty of people around at the time and probably still today that, um, that would seek out starting fights or making certain people feel uncomfortable. And so, yeah, our, our door policy was um, designed specifically to filter those people out, mm. um, which I think we did convincingly. Yeah. Yeah. So how did you get into DJing? So when I was a teenager, I guess, uh, I used to be a guitarist. Mm -hmm. um, you know, not a professional one, just a sort of amateur self-taught guitarist. But it was something that I really loved mm -hmm. and it was like a recreational outlet for me. And uh, yeah, so when I was 19, uh, I contracted meningococcal disease. And that was something that landed me in hospital for about 18 months. The first six months of which was, you know, a series of being on life support and having amputations to both legs and both arms and was basically just a hellish, horrible experience. Yeah. And then the latter uh, year of that, I guess, was all rehabilitation. So learning to walk using prosthetics, um, getting whatever prosthetics I wanted on my arms to be able to regain my independence and, and do what I could to, you know, resume a normal life or something like that, I guess. And you were playing the guitar, you are in university, right? Yeah, I was in university at the, at the time that I got sick and um, I wanted to work out a way that I could play the guitar again. Bit of a challenge playing guitar without hands because it's one of the first prerequisites that they usually ask kind people to is. have. Yeah. yeah, I was thinking of all these ways that I wanted to play the guitar again and it all kind of replicated what I was doing before. But what I'd learned through having a disability was that I had to do everything differently from now on mm. in my life, I had to relearn everything I'd ever cultivated. I mean, like I, everything that you do, I do a different version mm. of that same thing, mm. sometimes a better one, just not dressing <laughs> up, that's for sure. <laughs> you take the cake on that one. Um, well, but tell me about guitar. Yeah, so, so effectively uh, I realised, uh, by, by asking why regressively in a way, I worked out that what I really wanted was a creative outlet. I really wanted to be able to write music. I really wanted to be able to play with my friends. That didn't require me to be Jimi Hendrix. But also I was probably never gonna be Jimi Hendrix anyway, right? So all I needed to do was work out a way that I could play the guitar enough that I could write and play 
with friends. Mm. And so I went through a series of different designs for how I could um, play the guitar. I, I de designed all of these uh, mechanisms that would uh, press um, fretboards down in a certain way that I could play a bar chord and then move it up and down. And then I kind of looked at it from a different way and I thought, well, if I just tune everything, all the strings on it, so if I just held one fret, it would play a chord. And then I'm like, oh, that's what slide guitarists do. So I got myself a little bar and I went spoke to an engineer about it. And I got him to make a little thing that I could put my hooks in and then something for a, a pick holder as well. And then I just converted my guitar to a, a lap steel kind of thing. So I just played it on my lap. And immediately I knew how to play the thing because I already had the music theory behind me. I knew what I was doing. It was just getting over the physicality of it. Right? You know, you could have just played an auto harp. I could. <laughs> it's not as cool. An auto harp? Yeah, you, you just push the button and you go bring and it does I've, the chord. Sort of. I don't know what that. I've never guitar. seen that. Really? It's like a little thing that you can just. Bring. It's not. It's not nearly yeah. as cool. It as doesn't look as cool. Yeah. No. And now an auto harp. <laughs> Tom Nash doesn't have the same ring to it. So from the guitar yeah. and your love of music, that parlayed you into DJing. Pretty much. Yeah. We. Um, <clears throat> I mean, Chris was actually also in the band that I had, mm -hmm. and we'd played around at a lot of venues and things like that and got involved in working with them in some capacity and, and saw the opportunities that were there to be able to run events and thought that, you know, perhaps the best way for it to run a, a career like that is to actually, you know, look at that problem for, from reverse and work backwards from the end goal, which is kind of like just start your own thing and you're in control of the brand and do whatever you want. And that kind of paid off. And what is it's it good. that you love about DJing? I like the solitude of DJing. That's uh -huh. the word. I like the solitude of DJing. Actually, anything performative, I think, in the arts, the solitude is the best part of it. Just being I in a that. moment just by yourself. Yeah. Because when you're not playing, you're out in the crowd and people are talking to you and it can get, like, you know, I don't deal well with really big crowds mm. to begin with and mm. then people want to come up and chat and do all that. And that I find overwhelming. Mm. By the time that you're actually performing, it's just you. Mm. That's what I like about it. What are some of your coping mechanisms for that? I don't think I have any. Right. <laughs> Just minimise contact with humans. Yeah. No, that's probably not true. I, um, I'm pretty good at doing it. Uh, I don't appear to have a problem with it, but I think it just takes a lot out of me mm. um, at the end of it because I usually am on for that period of time. I don't necessarily care too much about if they were to ask me questions about my disability. In fact, I kind of encourage that a little okay. bit, often by trying to make them feel comfortable to ask those questions by poking fun at myself mm. or something like that. Uh, but I always encourage people to try to understand things better rather than uh, not ask questions or be reserved about things, because mm. I think that makes for a more open and educated society. Most people will have at least one question, usually quite trivial, totally fine. Uh, it's kind of a responsibility that I carry with me, I guess, mm. is, is to... How do you feel this. about that responsibility? Oh, fine, to be honest with you. I mean, yeah, th the reason I say responsibility because I do think that, you know, you, you can alter the fabric of the way that people perceive people with disabilities if you treat it fairly, if you treat questions fairly mm -hmm. and, you know, don't get too upset or offended if somebody asks you something that may otherwise have appeared personal. Mm. The only thing is it can get tiring after a while just because you're pretty much telling the same story all the time mm. or you're answering the same questions. Um, but other than that, I don't have a problem with it. And you've chosen to be an advocate and do things like TED Talks and public speaking. Um, what's the thought process behind, you know, putting yourself in the public eye versus having a private life? Um, I mean, Public speaking was something that I more or less fell into. I was doing a little bit of it before I did uh, TED Talk um, and then quite a lot more afterwards. Mm. The reason I like it is not as much the performative aspect of it. It opens the door for me to be able to research a hell of a lot into human psychology and behavioural psychology and things that really interest me and being able to map them onto my own experiences and then deploy that to audiences who would benefit from it. Often when I'm out in public, a child will stare at me. And if the child is particularly brave, they'll approach me and ask, are you a pirate?
To which I then need to respond once again, yes. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest, I've got two hooks, prosthetic legs and a penchant for hard liquor. <laughs> All I need is an eye patch and a parrot and I'm basically there. I noticed in your TED talk you use self-deprecating humour. Tell me about your choice to use comedy in your approach to the world. Humour, I guess, has been used as far back as we can remember to be a vehicle for broaching awkward topics. Mm. And so I usually try to use it with people as much as I can to get them comfortable uh, with my physical disability. Mm. I think it's a really good way because, I mean, if, if if I'm comfortable making jokes about myself, they would be comfortable asking questions. Mm. You know, it's kind of that yeah. meet me in the middle type thing. Yeah. I think it's good practice with anyone, but it particularly works well for me because it puts people at ease uh, with how comfortable I am in my situation that they feel free that they could talk about anything or be honest. Yeah. yeah. I guess I understand in public situations, people sort of sometimes are like, oh, oh is that a bloke or a Sheila? Oh, I don't know what to do. A and Sheila. I... <laughs> It's such an old world expression. <laughs> I'm from Brisbane. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Um, it's quite current there. Yeah. <laughs> it's trending on TikTok, in fact. Um, and I know that I've used that sort of self-deprecating humour to create space for myself and make people feel comfortable. Mm. And it's interesting because it definitely works and definitely disarms people. But I've also noticed with my experience um, that these days I can exist in environments where I don't have to make those jokes because either people understand or or sometimes also I think the humour comes from a place of, oh, let me make the joke because I know someone else is going to. So it's taking power back right. um, in those situations. Is That's there an interesting that perspective. I, I had never considered that from my perspective. It, I mean, I possibly. If it is, I'm not aware of it. But I do think it is a signal in a way. Um, where you're, uh, you don't take yourself too seriously, mm. which I, I value as a virtue in almost anyone. Yeah. And I think, yeah, it's, for me it's making people comfortable and signalling that I don't take myself too seriously, I think. Yeah. yeah. The reason I'm asking because I've noticed that in my experience, um, I've heard Hannah Gadsby talk about this idea of self-deprecating humour. I don't mm. know if you've seen her Nanette special. I have not, sorry. But she says that self-deprecating humour isn't... Uh, humility, it's humiliation, and that as someone who exists on the margins, you're actually making a joke about yourself to make other people feel comfortable to allow yourself a space to talk. Right. And I get that with, say, a marginalised community like the queer community, where historically we've been punchlines, mm. um, that using that sort of can sometimes fulfil that prophecy. Right. And actually people just respecting your identity would be a more desirable outcome. Mm. But I guess it's interesting in your situation because it's an individual situation. Mm. What do you think about that idea of self-deprecating humour isn't always a positive? Um, I think it would be very difficult to comment on because it would be a case-by-case, joke-by-joke type yeah. thing. Yeah. I think generally speaking, I don't use humour on behalf of a group. Mm -hmm. I use it on behalf of myself. Mm -hmm. um, and so... I have no problem using self-deprecating humour. I just don't like it when other people make jokes about my disability, not because it offends me, uh, but I don't want them stealing my material. <laughs> now, is that a joke? Because, I mean, it's obviously a joke, but is there any truth to that? Because how no, There's you... definitely truth to that. Yeah. I, I, I definitely don't want them stealing my material. No, but also, like, if people see you making jokes and yeah. then they think, oh, that's fine, Yeah. I can make a joke about Tom's disability. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And and a lot of my friends do. Right, yeah. but your friends do, and I guess that's they're just, a fine They're just line, not as funny it? as me, so they can't... <laughs> <laughs> Actually, they got... a couple of them have had a few over me one time and I think to myself, oh, why didn't I think of that? That was really good. Or I steal it or something. <laughs> I guess that's that thing though, isn't it? It's friends versus like who's making the joke. If there's people in the public sphere who are making jokes at yeah. the expense of a disabled person. Well, the, you've also got to think of what's the intention. Yes. Is the intention just to make you laugh or is it intention to make other people laugh at you? Mm. And then you've also got to think about the joke. Mm. Is it good? Yeah. Did it make me laugh? Like, some people have given me jokes about me that have actually made me like really laugh. I'm like, yeah. that's, even if I don't know you, I'm like, nice one. Yeah. You once said that one of your peeves is people saying, I could never go through what you've gone through. <laughs> Tell me about that. 
Well, the reason it annoys me when people say I could never have gone through what you did is that if there's any message that I want to get across to people, it's the exact opposite of that. Mm. You know, because, I mean, in all honesty, I probably never thought I would be able to get through something like that before as well. Turns out you can, right? And I think that's a great message, mm. you know, the, the, the message that, you know, buried deep down inside a lot of people, maybe even everyone, I have no idea, um, is, is the will to be able to overcome adversity that just needs to be excavated. Mm. If my story in any way allows people to think that, yeah, uh, maybe I could get through something horrible. And adversity's um, turned out to be a positive thing in your life. Yeah. I've, I've made adversity a positive thing in my life, I guess. I mean, yeah, I think it is a positive thing, generally speaking. Um, but you need to be part of that process. Mm. You know, you need to be able to look back on adversity and frame it in a certain way that you grow from it, rather than either just be eroded by it or even remain resilient to it. You, you need to be able to bounce back and get better from it. Mm. I've talked about the word resilience as being, you have, a, you have a preferred term instead of resilience? Anti-fragility is a little bit different to resilience. Uh -huh. So you would have a, a state of being fragile to stresses, then you would have a state of being resilient, and then you would have a state of being anti-fragile, which would be the opposite of fragile. And that would be that you, that you get better as a result of stresses. And this is a, an idea that was deployed by Nicholas Taleb. He uses it to describe systems, uh, ecology and economics I like to look at and frame adversity in a way that I get better as a, as a result of it. Mm. You know, if I, if I can grow and learn from bad shit that's happened to me, I mean, that's way better than being resilient, right? Because resilience is just remaining the same in the face of adversity? Yeah, I mean, resilience is just, you know, stagnation. Right. You know, it's, it's being able to weather the storm, uh, but not really improving that much. And if you can look back on adversity and see how you can grow from it such that that adversity makes you stronger in the future, then you really got something. What are some of those ways that uh, your adversity has led to understanding? And you've said that it's led to more lateral thinking uh, about situations. Yeah, I think, I think I've become a far better problem solver than I would have if I hadn't gone through those particular types of challenges. Um, you know, the example that I tend to use as an analogy is when I first started learning to walk with prosthetics. Um, once I was comfortable walking on flat ground, I had to get up a step. Mm -hmm. And I tried, you know, over and over again to get up a step the way that um, everybody knows how you sort of stand facing the step and you put a leg up and it wouldn't work for weeks. Mm -hmm. And it didn't work precisely because prosthetic feet and ankles to, uh, at right angles mm -hmm. and so you don't have the joint to move up. That wasn't obvious to me the first time I started doing it. And so even though I kept trying and trying and trying, it wasn't going to work mm -hmm. until I realised and broke down the problem in that way and, and thought, well, if I can substitute that ankle um, movement for a different uh, joint like my hip, which would mean turning my body to the side and walking up the step sideways, it worked immediately and I was able to get up a bunch of stairs, right? And it was then that it dawned on me that I was gonna have to learn how to do everything differently. Mm. Um, but then I, I kind of was able to map that on into other areas of my life, whether it be learning to play the guitar again or getting into DJing or whatever it was. A lot of these techniques that I used in problem solving were applicable um, in other areas of my life. So I think the adversity in that way has kind of given me strength in other areas. Mm. And that's an example of how you can turn something like that around using just a framing effect. I guess something that I'm interested in is that I know you as this three-dimensional character, but I guess so often your experience gets reduced to conversation about your disability. Mm. It's that thing where like so many facets of you get reduced to, oh, that's Tom or that's DJ Hookie, he has a disability. Yeah. What's that experience like and do you just have to accept it or have you found ways to...? Yeah, I think it's something that you kind of have to embrace mm. because these characteristics of people that we often think are the sum total of their parts are usually just one small aspect of a person. Mm. I don't necessarily uh, feel like 
I identify as a disabled person, mm. um, <clears throat> but I'm uh, quite constantly reminded that I am. Mm. And I don't by mean... others or by your body or <laughs> well, I mean both yeah. really. You know, because having a disability is a it's a hassle. Mm. Um, there are things that you, you can't do or it's more complicated to, you know, when you're travelling and things like that. So you are constantly reminded about it. I don't, um, I don't feel that there's much that I can't do that others can, save for playing the piano right. or something stupid, you know? Beyond chopsticks. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, chopsticks. I, I, don't, I wouldn't want to even attempt that. Okay. I certainly don't attempt to attach, you know, disability in that way to my identity. But I mean, I have to accept the fact that for many people that don't know me, the most interesting thing about me is the fact that I have two hooks mm. and I get that. Mm. Um, and so to some extent, that's always gonna be a part of me. Beyond your disability or beyond your DJing, who is Tom Nash? Like what are the other facets of you that make up you that we might not see at first glance? I am a pretty simple person. I have simple needs, simple wants, uh, simple pleasures. I like good food and good wine. I like traveling. I like uh, having a creative outlet. I love learning, I think, more than anything. Mm -hmm. my, my, my sense of interests is very fickle. I usually change from year to year something that fascinates me and I'll learn a bunch about it and then move on to something else, which makes it very uh, difficult to um, stick to something. Mm. So, uh, but other than that, uh, yeah, I mean, the three dimensional person you see as Tom is probably very, much more two dimensional in real life. I don't believe that. <laughs> so, where are you at now? I, I mean, in my mind, the last time we spoke, you were producing music and you remixed one of my songs for me, Welcome to Disgraceland, available on iTunes. Um, <laughs> But where are you now? What are you doing? Uh, these days, I mean, we haven't been uh, doing the club because of the pandemic, but we yes. will be getting back to DJing now that everything's opening up. Mm -hmm. um, but I also do quite a lot of speaking, which is, I guess, kind of my main gig right now. Um, in terms of what the future holds, I, I kind of like not knowing. Mm -hmm. Not even kind of, I love not knowing. Hmm. Um, I like the un unpredictability of the future. And so uh, I have absolutely no immediate plans that would make me uh, feel like I'm living a monotonous life. <laughs> so I'm just going to let the chips fall where they may, I guess. Well, I love that. Yeah. Thank you, Tom Nash, for joining me on One Plus One. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks.